The 2023 legislature passed a law prohibiting school employees, including school resource officers, from using certain kinds of restraints on students, prompting much confusion and in some cases the withdrawal of school resource officers from schools. Senator Bonnie Westland is sponsoring a bill that will clarify the law, and she joins me now. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Some are calling for no change or simply a repeal of the language that was enacted last year. Why is this not an option? Well, and I will say that those are probably two very different groups who want those things. So there are those who just want to repeal the work that we did last year, uh, and there are those who uh, think the current language is fine. Um, in conversation with some of my colleagues and certainly extensive conversations with stakeholders, what I discovered is that SROs, school resource officers, um, have all been sort of creatures of contract, if you will. So every single school district would contract with their local law enforcement agency if they chose to have an SRO. And I will tell you from reviewing those contracts, there was a lot of variability. Some of them required training, some of them required no training, some of them um, were very sparse in terms of the details. And uh, what we're doing is sort of building on the work that we did last year. And it should, I would say for absolute clarity, the current language before my bill does not ban prone restraints. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. The challenge came in how the bill was structured last year and how the statute is structured. So SROs were kind of put into that educational um, statute rather than in the law enforcement and the criminal statute. And so what this bill will do actually will provide that clarity it provides uniformity of training and a model policy that I think actually is far better, first and foremost, for our students. And we'll get to the model policy yeah. in a moment. Uh, you told the Education Policy Committee that nobody is getting what they want in this bill. And you've already s mentioned some of the stakeholders. There's law enforcement, there's student advocates, there's educators, there's parents. There are other interest groups that all have varying points of view. So how are you weighing all of those different things? Yeah, and I think what you meant to say is nobody got everything that they wanted. So I wanted to be really, I think you said oh. nobody got anything. Oh, nobody got no, 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 <laughs> but I just, so I was like, I wanna make sure we clarify that. Correct. Thank so you. so I'm a family law attorney. I do a lot of mediation and you know anytime you're negotiating something with um, especially multiple um, groups of people or individuals, you know the idea is to try to get to a compromise that basically everyone can live with recognizing the fact that nobody is probably going to get a hundred percent of what it is they're looking for. And so in conjunction with um, members of the other body and the, the administration, DPS, MDE, um, we configured a working group that wanted to try to address this issue. Um, and we took a comprehensive approach to it. We absolutely uh, looked at um, how can we bring in stakeholders who may have different perspectives on this issue. So law enforcement perspective is really important. We wanted to understand their perspective. Um, the education management folks, the school districts, the administrators, their perspective, really important. Education Minnesota represents the teachers. Their perspective is important. And then we also brought in um, Solutions Not Suspensions, which is a consortium of groups and individuals um, who are kind of an, uh, community advocacy groups. And each one of them has a really interesting and unique, valuable viewpoint. So I think when you put together a bill like this, you're trying to sort of balance those interests at so long as they serve the purpose of the bill. And I think that is the, the needle we've been trying to thread, and I think we've done it. Senator Steve Swadzinski, who is chair of the Education Policy Committee that first heard this bill, said that he's never encountered so many different definitions of words like imminent, reasonable, and shall versus must. And there's more than that, but those are the ones he mentioned. Does this bill clarify what these terms mean? I think it does. So I, I agree that, um, you know, we get lawyers involved and sometimes we mean different things. But specifically with the word imminent, that was in the statute. And the problem is, how can a school administrator or teacher it is a legal term really and and how are they going to assess in the moment is this imminent harm or not and so that also matched that language up with the paragraph that follows it um, the shall versus may um, from our standpoint uh, in the duties part of this having shall in there was important again to have uniformity so that when contracts are being developed between the uh, local school board or school district and the law enforcement agency, there are just a minimum, there are minimum things that have to be in the contract and they can always have more. And so the, the long 
answer to your question is I do believe that this bill actually does provide significant clarity um, around things like training, um, the topics that should be covered in the training. It covers a model policy, and our law enforcement officers deal with model policies all the time. And so let's go into the model policy, because your bill would direct the post board, which is the Peace Officer Standards and Training Board, to develop that model policy, and then it would be a mandatory uniform policy statewide. Um, topics to be covered include the proper use of force, uh, conflict de-escalation, alternative procedures that can be used to help people in crisis, how to build relationships, and more. Why a statewide, I mean, I think I know the answer, but why the statewide policy? Why one model policy? Sure, and again, this is the minimum. And so uh, looking at a lot of contracts, some contracts did include these sorts of things and some did not. And I think um, if we're looking for clarity for, for a law enforcement officer operating in the school, um, that is a, I would say that's qualitatively different. It's a different environment and a different purpose than maybe a patrol officer in the community. Everybody else in that school has had training on how to de-escalate, how to assist students who may be having you know, mental health crises and so on. And I think it's important that everyone in that school setting um, has that sort of level set uh, of what needs to happen in the school. First and foremost, these are institutions of learning, and I'm of the opinion everyone in there is there to support our kids, and I believe the SROs are also. Um, they are valued members of the team at our schools, and so I just feel like this model policy is part of that and, again, helps them develop the skill sets and also to have just clarity about what they are accountable to and for. And so just briefly, the bill specifically outlines the duties then of a school resource officer. Why be specific about that? Yeah, and, and it's not an exhaustive list. Again, it's sort of a bare minimum that contracts should uh, include. It, what it is really is a, it's a job description. And I think everybody can relate to the fact that there's a job description. And looking again at contracts, we found that there were some common themes or common um, items that were already in there. So again, I think it's to, um, it is the minimum, um, and communities and schools and law enforcement can develop their contracts to go over and above that. But I think setting a floor was a good idea. And since I have you here, I want to ask you about one other thing. Um, you are also sponsoring a bill that would expand the crime of doxing, which is when someone disseminates private or identifying information on the Internet. The expansion would include doxing a cell number or a personal email address, uh, the name or photographs of an official's minor child or children. Is this a preemptive move or has some of this already happened? So we do know that election officials have experienced, um, I guess you would call it aggression, um, even stalking in some cases here in our state. We heard testimony about that last year when the bill came up. Um, we know that this is also something that's unfortunately become more common across across the country. And this was uh, looking at sort of what other states do and sort of where their protections lie. Um, this just makes it a little bit more robust without going sort of over the line, but I think protecting minor children of law enforcement and election officials and volunteers is really important um, because unfortunately in this age of social media in particular, um, people can very quickly create a situation that is actually dangerous for, for our election officials and our law enforcement officers. And then this is an election year, so presumably having greater protections then would help those people who serve in the elections to feel more comfortable? Right, and I, and I do think that we um, have seen that there's been people who are leaving sort of serving in elections, and some of that is because a lot of our election judges tend to be um, senior citizens who maybe are just aging out of that. Uh, we do have student election judges, and we're trying to encourage our students to come in and do this so we can build the next generation. But I also think that people are hearing news stories about things that have happened, and it concerns them. Uh, and again, we have had incidents here um, in the state of Minnesota that I think raise some concerns. So we want to do everything we can to try and protect people. Senator Bonnie Westland, thank you for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. I enjoyed being here.